Hi, my name is Peter Goadsby. I'm a neurologist interested in headache disorders. I'd like to thank the organisers of the second Dubai Neurology Congress for asking me to speak. It's an interesting topic to be talking about atypical headache syndromes. Headache disorders are very common and there's a range of things that can happen. And I'm going to cover them in, in some order so not to be exclusive. Some things I'll touch upon have relevance to the disclosures I have in front of you. Most of them don't because they're odd or small or simply don't have obvious therapeutic implications. The International Classification of Headache Disorders describes quite a range of problems, 200 pages and more. Primary and secondary disorders in the cranial neuropathies. I'm going to move in and out of the primary headache syndromes when I talk about things that are atypical or unusual and pick some disorders that behave oddly and some disorders that frankly aren't headache, headache syndromes but appear very often in headache clinics for reasons that I'll come back to. So what does atypical mean? Well, I've taken atypical to mean not representative of the class of headache disorders. So odd, you might say. And this could encompass three things. It could refer to the unusual presentation of the usual, because it's, it's an aphorism in medicine that common things happen commonly, even if they happen in odd ways. Presentations that are not headache disorders, but often regarded that way, and they're interesting to think about. And then some of the uncommon headache disorders because they're not representative of the class as you, as you might say it. So thinking first about unusual presentations of what's usual. Well, I have to start with migraine. Because migraine is the commonest cause of disability due to a headache disorder globally. And because it's so common, it comes to, it comes to us not in, only in its canonical presentations, but in some unusual, atypical presentations. And I'm, I'm sure that, that's a, that you'll see that. And it's something that we very often have to deal with, particularly if you're interested in, in headache disorders. Migraine is seen everywhere um, in, in the Gulf, certainly Europe, North America, and even in Australia, where I'm from, broadly everywhere where it's been asked about. And the variety of the prevalence has probably got as much to do with ascertainment as it has to do with biology, although the latter probably has some role. Now, migraine is also common, as you know, in the very productive years, you might say, from, say, 18 to 65. And with a one-year period prevalence, 24%, just about the age of... Uh, of, of 40, extraordinary for females, extraordinarily common thing. So it's understandable that something that's this common and with this sort of impact would have its various odder manifestations. And I'm not going to go through all of them because there's quite an interesting range of things that can happen. Now, you see some patients, for example, it's a, a slide I'd like to use to think about the word migraine. It refers to the disorder, repeated attacks, less than 15 episodic, 15 or more chronic line in the sand. It's family history, it's triggering biology. And then the features of the actual um, attacks themselves, the premonitory features, the uh, canonical features that the International Classification of Headache Disorders relies upon, and then the post trauma and, and to mention the aura. Very simply, presentations which focus on one part of migraine are atypical in the sense that they can throw you off the initial history. Once these patients, for example, whom, whom I've seen one recently, in whom cognitive dysfunction is the predominant problem. And it's well recognized as a prodromal, premonitory symptomatology, but not often thought of as the dominant, the dominant problem. And the range of these you see. And I want to specifically say something about cranial autonomic symptoms. Looking at uh, a cohort that we reviewed, Nicholas van den Busser was able to show 
nearly three quarters of patients, predominantly with chronic migraine, who we were seeing, had one or other cranial autonomic symptoms. That's quite common. But I don't think cranial autonomic symptoms are front and centre when we think about a typical migraine, whether it's laterality, throbbing, nausea, light, sound, sensitivity. Anywhere you look, you find the same sort of information. Numbers are a little bit different, but the same information. Healthy uh, subjects can have, uh, these are German medical students, given capsaicin injections into the forehead, who can have cranial autonomic symptoms. So it's probably part of the trigeminal autonomic uh, reflex. Certainly Mark Oberman and others were able to look at a larger population group from Germany and showed quite a considerable number of patients, again, uh, up to 40% uh, for any one of these symptomatologies would have one of the cranial autonomic symptoms. This is not something that's restricted to adults. Amy Gelfin's published in pediatric uh, migraineurs, that about 70% have one symptom, which is quite in line with our adult uh, data. And this is not affected by age or gender or laterality or episodic chronic migraine. This seems to be a thing, if you want, with the activation of these trigeminal autonomic pathways. Indeed, in experimental uh, medicine settings with nitroglycerin-triggered migraine, Nazi Carson has been able to show recently that about half patients who we trigger will have one or more cranial autonomic symptom, and about half of the cranial autonomic symptoms will occur in the premonitory phase, or you might consider atypical. But the more you think about the anatomy and physiology of this system, the more you have to think that it's not so, un not so unusual, perhaps. Certainly the afferent in the trigeminal uh, nerve, the first vision of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic division, projecting into the nucleus caudalis, the C1 and C2, and then reflex connection back to the superior salivatory nucleus, traversing out the seventh cranial nerve, passing through the geniculate ganglion, and then synapsing in the hexamethonian sensitive nicotinic uh, classic autonomic ganglion, the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion, which sits in the pterygopalatine fossa for uh, nomenclature range of rich transmitter systems. This is a well-established um, reflex. It's therefore not surprising that many headache syndromes, if you go and dig around in them, will have cranial symptoms and not so surprising that it happens in migraine. Although I think given the emphasis we have on these symptoms in cluster headache, they're largely considered atypical in this setting. Now, it's important in terms of how patients are treated. The symptoms are very often uh, nasal congestion, for example, some eye watering, maybe a little bit of itchiness with that, can start a conversation around sinus disease. And indeed, this is some work that Kurt Schreibner and uh, Roger Cady were doing some years ago, looking at symptomatologies that are in, in patients that have got International Headache Society defined migraine and have symptomatologies that one could call sinus symptoms. It's not so surprising to have pain in the maxillary region. It's not, uh, not the end of the universe. And nasal congestion, runny nose, eye watering, uh, itchy nose, all of these you would think of as cranial autonomic symptoms. And instead of thinking of this as people with sinus disease, these are people with migraine and cranial autonomic activation. And indeed, when they took 24 subjects um, who said they'd been diagnosed with uh, sinus disease, 23 out of 24 had ICHD, one migraine. Um, symptomatology, 14 had, uh, had rhinorrhea. Of 17 who, who claimed this, sumatriptan 50 milligrams made them pain-free in two hours, not so unusual for a trip town, and they're the sort of symptoms uh, that they had. Beware cranial autonomic symptoms in migraine. They're very common. One could call it atypical. I think it's simply not canonical. Now, when you think about atypical tension type headache comes up in terms of, it's certainly in terms of, I think, referral practice. These are the appendix criteria. And I find it very useful to apply these criteria in practice because they, I think, more clearly differentiate migraine and tension type headache. And the particular emphasis I'll place is on uh, D here where there's no nausea, no vomiting, no photophobia, no phonophobia. That is 
featureless headache as a concept for tension type headache. So if you then you compare uh, migraine with tension type headache, you have throbbing and no throbbing, a movement effect and no movement effect, nausea, photophobia, phonophobia, and none of the above. And that line in the sand, I think, enables one to more clearly think about what is a typical tension type headache, that is featureless headache, versus what is more likely migraine, for example, photophobia rather than photophobia and phonophobia, and what we call at the moment, we call probable, uh, probable migraine. Tension type headache in, is, in many ways is atypical, certainly in my practice, if one applies this type of diagno diagnostic criteria, and I think it has considerable utility in practice. Now, the burden of headache is bound to be uh, migranous in referral practice, um, migranous in practice altogether, when one looks at what happens in general practice. So three quarters of patients, this is the landmark studies of perspective, our open label study that tracked uh, migraine for uh, three months or six attacks with a diary, and then experts assigned diagnoses. As you see, if you take clear migraine, ICHD migraine, three quarters of patients going to the GP complaining of headache had that, and about 20%, 18%, had migranous headaches, so one of the criteria weren't there. And I would argue that, based on what I was just saying, that this is all from a biological point of view, migraine. And of course, headache is the commonest thing that's pitching up to neurology. And if you look at general neurology, it's more than this approximately 20% from uh, UK data because much of the super specialty diagnostic uh, and management problems are hived off into those sorts of clinics. Another atypical problem you might say is this issue of vestibular migraine it's in the appendix of ICHT3 five episodes current or past history of migraine vestibular symptoms and the 50% um, of episodes associated with typical migranous phenomena vertigo the sensation of self-motion when no self-motion is occurring or the sensation of distorted self-motion during otherwise normal head movements of Iranian society uh, definition. We see in our clinics about 40% of people have this, uh, have vertigo by the Bairani definition associated with the, their attacks. This is a complex area of vestibular migraine. And to some extent, I think mild vestibular symptoms are actually quite common in migraine presentations. And what's the atypical component of this is their prominence of vestibular symptoms in some patients as opposed to headache and other parts of the disorder. So let's talk about the presentations where actually it's not a headache disorder at all. That makes it very uh, atypical. So one of my favorite ones, migraine aura. Well, this is typical Lashley's aura on the left that uh, the um, scintillating scotoma that was enlarged and the, what we think the passage of reduced blood flow uh, increased blood flow followed by reduced blood flow that spreads across the cortex and uh, uh, a blood flow map there, Xenon 133 map of a patient actually having, uh, having an aura, an original, uh, original picture. Now, when you contrast that, that's jagged lice fortification spectra here named after the four of uh, fortifications that used to be prominent in European, uh, to defend European cities. If I contrast that, with the patients who come to see us with what they draw on the right. Uh, child's drawing uh, at the top there, little dots uh, everywhere. And a more, an, you more say, more say a rendition uh, at the bottom there of what patients are seeing. Continuous uh, moving dots, shapes that are uncountable and distort perception in the presence of what is a normal visual uh, examination. This is a case, one of the cases published on, um, beautiful example of a child showing us the after image, for example, palinopsia from the tree, the sparks in the, in the sky, squiggles, blue field, field in toptic phenomenon, and the small little circles, clear circles that they see, the actual uh, visual snow. It's continuous, dynamic, tiny dots in the entire visual field, 
for this for the syndrome, palinopsia, uh, illustrated there on the bottom right, the bluefield and toptic phenomenon. Uh, sorry, bottom left for the palinopsia, bottom right for bluefield and toptic phenomenon, photophobia and night vision. This is not consistent with migraine or at all. It's very typical of what it is: visual disturbance, which we think has import has an important basis in the central nervous system. Another thing that we see from time to time, which masquerades as head pain, but actually isn't pain at all, is exploding head syndromes. This sudden feeling as though the head's exploding, of sudden noise. Sometimes there's a flash of light. It's, it's a sleep disorder to transition between sleep and wakefulness. It was first described as a pistol shot or a blow to the head by uh, Weir Mitchell in 1876. People have called it a sensory shock. Uh, they've called it snapping of the brain um, and exploding head syndrome is a term that uh, John Pierce introduced in 1988 uh, in the uh, Lancet. In series, it tends to be older age, said to be female preponderance. Uh, actually, the cases I've seen have been males. There are no secondary cases that I've seen in the literature. We've had an excellent outcome, uh, certainly in uh, one patient with single pulse transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation. So it's not a headache problem. It's an interest if you see it, and certainly something that the sleep disorder people are well, um, well interested in. Now, lastly, let me talk about some uncommon headache syndromes, which you might say are atypical for the class of all headache disorders. Let me start with numular headache. Pain, highly variable duration, which is a small circumscribed area, coin-shaped. Got a patient, a patient in the UK at the bottom there, putting a pound coin on their head, and a patient in the US putting a quarter on their head where their pain was. And I use the coin for the numbing or pneumostatic headache, you might say. So it's continuous or intermittent, sharply contoured, fixed in size, round or elliptical, and some centimeters in diameter. I've treated this phenotypically. I think that um, the question I asked myself is. Does it fit one of the primary headache disorders if I put the pain distribution down? We published on some cases last year where it clearly does fit a migraine uh, phenotype. I've seen it fit a, 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 an intermethacin sensitive phenotype. I mostly, we've seen patients that have some migraine biology or past history or something migrinous as well that's, uh, that's happening. This is a, a disorder I think that, that's, got a number of strings to it. And to understand it is going to require, I think, the more pure form that doesn't have other primary headache disorder phenotypes mixed in to nail down what's happening with the pathophysiology. And it's primary cough headache, described by uh, Charles Simons in a, a paper in Brain in uh, 1956. So these are uh, headaches that are brought on by coughing, coughing, bending, straining, valsalva manoeuvre, but cough is a simple way of putting it, but not by prolonged exercise. Um, they're sudden onset, they peak almost immediately, they can last a second up to a couple of hours, and th there's no other, we can't account for them another uh, ICHD diagnosis. And the particular secondary one, of course, is, um, is the Alciari. We've looked into this in a series of patients. There's quite an association between cough headache and chronic cough, unsurprisingly. Interestingly, the cough precedes a headache by a median of seven with a range of three to 11 years. So we think it's a sensitization process that goes on. Interestingly enough, CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptides, implicated in cough hypersensitivity syndromes quite uh, independently by the respiratory folks and one wonders about the link between those. It's extraordinary. Uh, the Simons described this and Neil Raskin described it in his uh, paper on this subject, that lumbar puncture, well, our experience about one in five, lumbar puncture is just curative, extraordinary after a lumbar puncture, removal of 20 uh, mils of uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Not all patients, but certainly in a clear group, it just, uh, it stops the problem. Indomethacin uh, is the probably the most popular treatment, 25 to 50 milligrams three times a day. And isn't it interesting that indomethacin will change uh, CSF uh, pressure? I think there's a story in that. And we've seen non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation be very helpful for um, 
for primary cough headache. We considered this because non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation is also actually quite useful for paroxysmal hemicranian, hemicranian continua to endomethacin sensitive headaches. And one wonders about that disparate um, pathophysiological link to therapy. And lastly, hypnic headache, headache that occurs going to sleep. It's unsurprising, Neil Raskin described in 1988. Typically 10 days per month. Some patients may have it more. There's a large case series that, uh, that suggests that. So the attacks are minutes to hours. There are no cranial autonomic symptoms and no restlessness. Quite important with a differential diagnosis of attacks that are happening in the uh, early hours of the morning, cluster headache. Caffeine seems to work. It's almost counterintuitive to give that at bedtime, but it, it seems to work. It's quite reliable in the patients in whom it works. Lithium is probably the most reliable of all the things that uh, we use, and perhaps indo, uh, indomethacin is useful. And there's a, an interesting link when you think about um, hypnic headache and some what, what's happening with therapies. Now, lithium itself will increase um, increase slow wave sleep, which is interesting because caffeine does the same thing. Bill has taken an illustration here from a paper by Patterson in 2009 showing the second component of the slow, of slow wave sleep being increased. I think you can see that very nicely, caffeine compared uh, to placebo. And you see the quantitation uh, down the bottom. Now, remarkably, Holly in their uh, paper looking at the phenotype of uh, hypnic headache found that the majority, 58% of patients who had, the, uh, who had their attack had it between 2 and 4 a.m., which is when typically the second part of slow wave sleep occurs. It's hard to think it's an accident that the most effective drugs, lithium and caffeine, intersect in the same place as when the attacks occur with something measurable like slow wave sleep. I think we're going to get some, we get some insights into this also somewhat unusual headache. So we kind of could have picked other things. I could, have, uh, I could have easily talked about sex headaches, sort of atypical to presentation, but interesting in many ways. I could talk about sunk and uh, I could have talked just about stabbing headache, which is an interesting phenomenon. It's a rich area to be in. It's a pleasure to, uh, to again, to be involved. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, uh, to make the presentation. Thank you very much.